In a pair of decisions released today, the Supreme Court has shown itself to be nothing more than a partisan tool of the right wing. Let's talk about in today's video. I'm Mike Greiner. I'm a lifelong Democratic activist who's concerned about the direction our country is taking. If you share my concerns, maybe you could like this video and subscribe to this channel and click that little bell that will notify you when I post something new. So what's especially notable about the two decisions that were released today is, number one, that they use the exact opposite logic to arrive at the conclusions that they arrived at, which, of course, are the partisan conclusions that the right wing wanted the Supreme Court to reach. And number two, how they are in direct contradiction of an earlier decision that the same Supreme Court had made. So the first case at issue, Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, which is the one that's gotten the most attention, refused to strike down laws that were passed in Arizona that make it harder for people to vote, which are especially targeted at minority groups. What's notable about this case is it relies on the balancing act that courts will frequently rely upon, where on the one hand, it looks at the burden upon the state, and on the other hand, looks at the burden upon the individual rights. So on the one hand, the court says that the fear that the state is trying to address is election fraud, something that is virtually non-existent and which the states couldn't show was there was any evidence existed. On the other hand, is the burden upon the individual voting rights of the citizens, particularly those who are people of color. Now, interestingly enough, the evidence of the burden of this law being particularly felt by people of color is overwhelming. There's really no question about it. Did the Supreme Court, though, weigh that evenly? Well, really not. Basically, what the Supreme Court said is that it doesn't matter how much evidence you have that this law is placing an unequal burden upon people of color. Literally, there has to be an effort by the state to deny them the right to vote entirely. So if you provide them with any way that they can vote in any way, shape, or form, then that still does not violate the law. Now, this law, combined with an earlier case that dealt with labor unions, shows that the Supreme Court is basically pursuing the conservative wish list when it comes to disempowering anybody who is not in the white conservative elite. So even though there were some surprises and people are saying, oh, the court isn't as conservative as what is, was expected, the truth of the matter is when it comes to what really matters, which is power within the United States, the court is consistently handing power to the white conservative elite to the expense of everybody else. Now, the second relevant case is Americans for Prosperity versus Bonta. This is a case basically brought by the Koch brothers that argues that charities should not have to disclose who their donors are. Now, that might seem like a fairly innocuous decision, but the place that it becomes an issue is that many of the charities now are being used for political work. And in fact, you could even take the step further where other kinds of tax entities or tax-free entities are being used for political work. We hear about the super PACs, for example, and donors do not have to be disclosed in those. Now, the irony of this case is that the author of the decision is Chief Justice Roberts. And in an earlier decision, the Citizens United decision, Roberts has said that, oh, the solution to this issue of campaign finance is more disclosure, that you should have to disclose who the donors are. And yet with this case now, just a few years later, he says that charities don't need to disclose who their donors are. So which is it, Justice Roberts? And this is similar to the situation with the Bernovich case, where in an earlier case on voting rights, Shelby County v. Holder, the Supreme Court said, oh, you know, the way that you need to deal with these issues of racially targeting certain groups to impose voting restrictions is to sue under Section 2. Well, under this case now, basically the court says that, oh, you know, under Section 2, we're going to make the burden so high that it's going to be virtually impossible to succeed in these cases. So again, the court is basically taking an earlier recommendation, basically softening a decision that was very harsh, and now saying, oh, but that remedy that we've offered you, well, we're going to take that away too. What's especially disturbing about these two cases and demonstrates how partisan this court has become, and it's not really a neutral arbiter of the law, is how the logic of the two cases literally are the opposite of each other. According to the court, the reason that it struck down the requirement 
requirement for donor disclosure is that it was too broad, that it addressed a narrow problem, that there was a little problem that was addressed with a very broad response. And the state should narrowly tailor its responses to deal with narrow problems. That's essentially what the court said. On the other hand, in the Brnovich case on voting rights, the court said that despite the fact that there's virtually no evidence of electoral fraud anywhere in the country, that that state interest is enough of an interest that literally they can take these broad-based restrictions on voting and apply them. One court had characterized these attacks on voting rights as taking a sledgehammer to a glass table. And that's basically what they're doing. They're completely upending the system to deal with a problem that is really non-existent. So what do these decisions have in common? They have in common that they delivered the result that the conservatives wanted. And that is to take power away from people of color and their supporters and to give it to the white conservatives who are increasingly a minority in this country. Up until now, what has protected the court from an action to expand it or to reduce its powers has been this sense that it is this neutral arbiter of the law, that somehow it is above the partisan battling that's going on. Well, with these two cases, the court demonstrated that that is not the case. The court is nothing more than a legislative body that steps in and changes the law where it believes it's necessary. Remember, these judges are unelected. These judges are not part of a democratic process. They're given lifetime appointments. And as Mitch McConnell demonstrated, you can manipulate the process to make sure that your party gets the nominations rather than sharing it equally between the two parties. If the court is going to act like a partisan legislative body, basically stepping in and legislating, changing law where Congress had set the law, and it's important to note, in these two decisions, basically, the court is stepping into an area where legislature, in the case of the Americans for Prosperity case, the California legislature, and in the case of Brnovich, Congress, actually pass laws. The democratically elected bodies pass laws. And Congress steps in and says, no, 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 we're not going to allow them. And the basis for the argument against them is not a constitutional basis. Basically, it's a reading of the legislative language. And this reading of the legislative language is directly contradictory to what the legislature stated was the intent of the laws. So the point is, if the Supreme Court is going to act like a partisan legislative body, we should treat it as such. And all that deference that we've given to it, where we've said, oh, we need to protect its ability to state the law, all that needs to be wiped clean, and Supreme Court process needs to be changed so that it reflects a more democratic process. Well, if you agree with me or disagree with me, I'd love to hear your comments down below. If you could like this video and subscribe to this channel, that'd be a big help. I'll see you in the next video. And in the meantime, let's hope for continued progress. Thank you.